Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters here on France 24. I'm Mark Owen. In this edition, when the people no longer want the so-called people's choice, voters in Venezuela made a decision they hadn't made in almost two decades in the recent election. They voted for the opposition. President Nicolas Maduro seemed to accept the voice of the people, acknowledging certain errors and that life in Venezuela needed to be improved. Our report goes to the heart of the matter. Witness why Venezuela has grown disenchanted with the Bolivarian dream of the late Hugo Chavez. Is the revolutionary left then on its last? Venezuela is a country that has the biggest oil reserves in the world. Riches literally on tap. Yet the people can't buy even the most basic items in the shops, such as toilet paper. Mark Perman and Sylvan Rousseau have been to Caracas. This is their report. It's been nearly three years since the death of Hugo Chavez, but in the January 23rd neighborhood of Caracas, his spirit is alive and well. Chavistas reign supreme here, and entering without their say-so is not advised. Surveillance cameras, lookouts, or any outsiders are quickly noticed. Indeed, anyone in opposition would do well to keep a low profile. And yet it's that very opposition that secured a shock victory in Venezuela's parliamentary elections on December 6th, even in this Chavez stronghold. It's true that in the January 23rd neighborhood, it was very difficult to campaign. It was impossible just to put up posters. Of course, we worked very hard down to the smallest detail. But it's clear that the people have punished the government. They have deliberately voted against it. The people want to change, and change came. In this neighborhood, where it was practically impossible to win, Chavism was defeated here. This is the neighborhood where Hugo Chavez set up his headquarters to lead his first coup d'etat on February 4th, 1992. His body still lies in a nearby mausoleum. Many within the Chavista movement privately admit they're still surprised by their defeat, even though their leaders have a simple explanation. Of course, errors were made. But beyond that, Venezuela is under a constant international and national pressure by the lackeys of the American empire. What is the goal? To destroy the Bolivarian revolution. And how are they going to do that? By supporting the far right here. To others, though, the real reason behind the political upset seems more obvious. Fundamental social rights guaranteed under Chavism, like free housing, education and health care, simply weren't enough to counter the harsh economic reality. Global oil prices have plummeted, inflation runs rampant, and basic necessities are in short supply. Well, I hope to find rice and toilet paper here. I haven't been able to find toilet paper for a month, and I'm hoping to find soap too. I said to myself, go on. I'm going there in the hopes of finding everything I need. Sometimes I come up empty. Even the more affluent suburbs face similar struggles. In El Hatillo, the mayor shows off his municipal clinic where everything seems to be in working order. But behind the doors of the emergency service, gaping holes emerge. This is our main stock of medical supplies. Normally it should be full of all kinds of medicines. Most of what is available has been donated. The staff say they're being forced to find creative solutions. We had patients who needed kidney transplants. They had to seek treatment from a vet. To get their transplant, they had to go and buy drugs that are usually given to livestock. There have been many cases of local people who are brought to hospitals or clinics but die because of a lack of proper drugs. That's a frequent occurrence in Caracas, which holds the dubious reputation of being the most violent city in the world. Research indicates 119 homicides for every 100,000 residents. The Belomonte Morgue sees many families in mourning. He was shot three times. The hospital was full. He had to go elsewhere and he died. They could have saved him if they had been able to operate. The morgue has also become a crucial font of information for local journalists. 
You can't access daily statistics here. They're basically a state secret. For the government and Bolivarian system, there is no violence in Venezuela. It's like some kind of fiction that independent journalists must have created. Such independent journalists have noted at least one major change. For the first time in over a decade, they're allowed access to the National Assembly. The Speaker of the House believes that's important. Unlike the last 17 years, the doors of the National Assembly are now open to you, regardless of your political views. When I walked into Parliament, I felt so much emotion because there was so much time that we weren't allowed in. More than 14 years without being able to come in and report what was happening. On top of a crumbling economy, the new majority is also tackling the controversial problem of political prisoners. Families have been quick to make their pain heard. I'm a father. I'm talking to the interior minister about allowing me to speak to the prisoners. There are so many of them. All of them, because I'm not the only mother who is dealing with this. Thank you. I'm counting on you. I'm so afraid, because in a Venezuelan prison, everyone is at risk of dying. The most visible leader of this struggle is Lilian Tintori. Every day we're stronger, unshakable despite the insults and torture. For two years, she and her children have been left to fend for themselves. Their father and her husband is Leopoldo Lopez, the jailed leader of the opposition Voluntad Popular. Lopez was arrested in February 2014. He's since been convicted and sentenced to over 13 years in prison for publicly inciting violence. His detention has been sharply criticized by the UN and by human rights groups. Every week, Lilian travels to a prison an hour outside of Caracas. I feel emotion, love, joy. Emotion as if I had a date with my boyfriend or fiancé and I was going to see him. Because today that's what my marriage is about, a prison visit. But the weekly visits are far from easy. Many times I go inside and they make me get naked, crawl on the floor with no clothes, nothing, no stockings, nothing, just to humiliate me. Today, she's not even allowed in. No explanation is given. Lillian immediately documents the incident on social media. Now Leopoldo is going to be alone today. He won't know what's happened. He'll be waiting for me. I denounce this violation of our rights, not only mine, but also those of many families who queue up in front of the prisons and who aren't allowed to go in. She believes one man is to blame for what she describes as psychological torture. This is the Ramo Verde military prison. Diosdado Cabello is in charge. He's the one who installed cameras. Videos, everything is recorded. My family is recorded all the time in the prison. And these videos are broadcast in Diosdado Cabello's TV program every Wednesday. He's using my family for his bad politics. Politics to intimidate, politics to persecute, mean, inhuman, cruel politics. Because that's the kind of man he is. A cruel, inhuman man with no scruples. Until December's elections, Diosdado Cabello was the president of the National Assembly. As a former soldier and friend of Hugo Chavez, his fall from power didn't dent his popularity within the movement's ranks. Today I'm the one crying, but tomorrow you'll be crying tears of blood. Trying to shed the secretive stigma still tied to the regime, 
He's decided for the first time to invite journalists to the studio where he records his weekly TV program. We're brought under cover of night to a military zone in Caracas, the exact location unknown. Never, not today, not tomorrow, never will we be the imperialist lackeys. For over three hours, he holds court on national television with the provocative title, The Spiked Club. Under the shadow of portraits of Simon Bolivar and Hugo Chavez, he skewers his rivals and extols the virtues of their leadership. We're going to listen to Commander Chavez. I'm ready to go into the streets to defend the revolution against all threats. The opposition accuses Cabello of trying to cling to power despite being voted out and attempting to stir up trouble. Decide for yourselves. We have lost and I am still here. What lies? They said that Diazdado was going to topple the state. And they're the people who said I have no influence on the army. Me, I like the army because I'm a soldier like Commander Chavez, but I am respectful. Still, he recognizes that something needs to change. We must reflect on this defeat and work to regain our supporters. We must unite and start from the beginning once again. On January 15th, President Nicolas Maduro delivered his annual address to lawmakers for the first time in front of a largely hostile audience. <laughs> Today, I am in front of Parliament, where, thanks to the Constitution, to democracy and to freedom, those who oppose the Bolivarian Revolution have won a majority of seats. The basic themes were familiar. Allegations of an economic war waged by the United States and its allies. But what happened next was unprecedented. The new majority leader launched a scathing and very public criticism of the president's policies to his face and on live television. To the crowds gathered outside the National Assembly, the feeling was unmistakable. In the new Venezuela, the legacy of Hugo Chavez now hangs by a thread. Our reporter, Mark Perman, is here in the studio. Mark, thank you for your report. Is the Chavez philosophy dead and buried? No, I wouldn't say so. First of all, because, yes, the Chavez camp lost those elections on December 6th, but they still garnered 40% of the vote. So there's still sizable support for uh, the Chavista camp, as uh, it's known. But clearly, this was a major setback, including, and we show it in the report, in areas where they thought they had totally things under uh, control. And so there's a big danger for them uh, if they don't renew their ideas and their people uh, that they may become history, uh, because we've seen the crisis is tremendous. Uh, record uh, inflation, record uh, violence, uh, the barrel of oil just dropping to record lows. But people also are unhappy with the way the government has responded to this and also to allegations of corruptions, narco-trafficking. You add this all together and you have what happened on December the 6th. And clearly, it doesn't mean Chavez has been buried a second time, but uh, there's a big, big if hanging over uh, the uh, Bolivarian revolution, as they call it. OK, so it's one thing for the opposition in opposition to talk about change. Once they get power, of course, now they have to kind of put into action what they've been talking about. It, do people feel that the opposition can actually change things? Well, yes, but the problem is they don't get full power because there's still a, a president uh, who has lots of power. They control the National Assembly. It's a big change, but it means they need to work together. And it's very difficult because they're really at odds on many, many issues. I mean, when you hear uh, one camp talk about the other, it's the devil. And uh, so really working together is going to be a problem. But they don't have a choice. And that might be the only glue is that both the government and the president realize that the country is on the verge of economic collapse. And so they have to take really the bull by the horns, for instance, raise uh, the price of gasoline, which is just ludicrous in Venezuela. But it's considered as something the people have the right to have. So they will have to take 
difficult measures, and we'll have to see if the opposition can deliver, and especially if they can work together with President Nicolas Maduro. It's not a given. What do ordinary people in Venezuela, Mark, think about Hugo Chavez now? What do they think about Maduro? What do they think about the USA? Is it the enemy? Was it ever really it, the enemy? It, it depends uh, who you talk to. Uh, as we see in the reports, you know, the uh, diehard Chavistas still think this is all part of an economic war waged by the US to weaken its adversaries, especially uh, Iran, Venezuela, by bringing down the price of oil and just making sure uh, that they uh, sink. However, more and more people, including those who, who supported Chavez and voted against uh, his camp in the last elections, realize that there's much more to it. And uh, so, yes, there, there is this feeling. However, Hugo Chavez himself, you see him everywhere, on the walls, in the slogans, everywhere, still around Caracas today, obviously still beloved in his own uh, camp, but even the opposition respects him. It's also a way of, uh, for them to underscore that Nicolas Maduro is no Hugo Chavez, that he doesn't have the charisma, but also he doesn't know how to really take the bull by the horns when uh, he needs to. And so clearly this has been a problem for Nicolas Maduro. He obviously says, you know, I'm Hugo Chavez in a new version, but uh, the contrast is there and people made him pay in the last election. Chavez, clearly a very tough act to follow. Mark, thank you very much indeed. To see Mark Perlman and Sylvain Russo's reporter once again, you can, of course, via our website, francefancat.com. This is Reporters on France Fancat. Stay with us.